This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Welcome back to The Forging Table. The mission of Undaunted Life is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. At The Forging Table, you'll see a group of regular guys forging spiritual resilience by digging into God's word. And we're welcoming all of you to come along on that journey with us. That's Ryan, that's Caleb, that's Adam. Guys, we are digging into Psalm 42. And uh, we're all a little bit distracted right now because we can smell the brisket that's Mm -hmm. resting downstairs. So we are literally one hour away from perhaps the greatest meal in the history of of mankind. Now, three of us at this table are going to treat it as a strictly carnivore meal because it is a 14 pound brisket. But Ryan, as we established last week, you know, he's got his, he's got his salad ready to go, which, okay. Hey, if that's what you want to do with your life, that's fine. We don't need to bring it back up. But with this one, I'm curious. Cause as I was reading through Psalm 42 and we'll, or Psalm 63, did I say 42 at the beginning? It is 42. It is we are doing 42. For, yeah. I'm on the wrong page. Okay. I was like, dude, I'm, I would yeah. edit this out, but you know, Kyle's an idiot too. So just in case you thought I'm the only one that makes fun of other people for being an idiot, um, I'm an idiot as well. So here's the thing with Psalm 42. I want to know, because as I was reading this, for whatever reason, I went to the last time that I was so unbelievably gassed out that I didn't feel like I could continue operating. Okay? So I want to know from you guys, the last time you were physically gassed, so that could be, it would probably be like in some sort of a workout or sports context or something like that. But for you, what was the last time where you were like completely gassed out? You had nothing left. I went on a hunting trip in Canada and it was a backpack trip for mountain goat. And this was a special trip where a lot of guys fly in or they take horses in, but this was 100% hiking. So I had a 70 pound pack with my backpack, backpack, um, tent, everything. And we hunted for, I think it was day five by the time I was done. And I was probably hiking 13 to 15 miles a day. And I finally harvested the animal. And by the end, I remember getting in the tent for the last day thinking I could not hunt tomorrow if I had to. And I wasn't sure how I was going to get down the mountain either. Completely and totally gassed. I was done. Yeah, I remember your training for that because, I mean, you take your training seriously, but your training for that is like, all right, we're not going to go all the way up to Canada we're not going to, you know, pay for the trip, like get this tag, like do this whole thing. Because you had also said that that those guides every year, they have guys come out there and they just either don't train or they train for a week or two. And then they just assume they're going to walk around the Canadian Rockies. Yeah. And they had, they have guys that uh, refuse to continue. I mean, it is, it is a no joke. If you don't train for months in advance, you're totally screwed. You cannot do what we went to go do. Walking over deadfall, climbing these giant mountains. There's just no way you could do it. Yeah, you got it. Nailed it. All right, Caleb, Ryan? Um, I mean, there's one that stands out in my head that was too long ago to admit, but Uh-oh. I'll probably say, <laughs> I mean, it was this, it was similar without hunting, just hiking. We went from we went from 6 a.m. in Oklahoma City to 6 p.m. We're at 12,000 feet, and that was rough. Oh, yeah. And then, and then summited a 14 or the next day. You went up 12,000 feet in one day? Yeah. Oh, I mean, the goodness. first several thousand was on an airplane, but, you know. Still, the rest. I would have gotten sick for sure. <laughs> yeah, that and that was the main reason. But I mean, the next day we felt. I mean, that was. I don't. I don't think it was quite as bad as yours. But nope. um, I'll say the the most recent time was probably the last time I went to Fight Club, which is <laughs> yeah. also too long ago. Yeah, also too long ago. Which we can fix that. We can remedy that very quickly. But it's that's true, the thing but not is, whenever I lead the workouts, like part of the reason why I do that is because it's like if you haven't been in here in a while, it's like, hey, I'm showing you what you've been missing, right. and I'm also showing you the gap that there are levels to all these things and you don't want that level and those gaps to get any bigger. Well, I think the other reason too is like, I mean, I, I work out, I work out hard, but I don't think unless it's someone else that's pushing you, you or some other like task, right? That you really can't go as far as you should. Well, and there's, you can. there's some science. I can't remember who was talking about if it was Joe Rogan or Andrew Huberman or something like that. But it's like, if you know what you're about to try and do, mm-hmm. it's way easier than when someone else is telling you how to do it. So right. if I know in my head, because one of the things I would make people do is do wall sits. Mm-hmm. Well, I know how long we're going to do the wall sit, but I'm the only one that knows. Mm-hmm. And so everyone else is suffering and they're also ignorant because they have right. no freaking idea when this pain is going to end. Whereas I'm like, oh, we just got like 30 more seconds. And everyone's like, I have no uh, no idea how much longer Kyle's going to do this. He's such a masochist. And yep. so part of it is like, if you know, like what the torture is going to be, like it's it's going to be a little bit easier. Yep. Mr. Horn? Just walking up the stairs of this dude. No, <laughs> oh, no we do not accept <laughs> that answer. Um, and there's two, like Fight Club, one time, you... uh I always hate it when you make us do those wall sits and then let somebody punch us in the stomach. 
Just make sure your core's tight. Like, yeah, it's not I'm just like, for fun. My core's not tight. I've got a keg. <laughs> you know, I look like Burt Kreischer. I'm like a bald Burt Kreischer. That's okay. What about, you you know, make it tight. What about when you make somebody walk over our legs as we're all on, yeah. on a row? Oh, that's yeah, a good yeah, one. Yeah. I never had that one. Shout out. If you're a coach in this room, this is what you need to do. Line everybody up on the wall, like shoulder to shoulder. Have them get down and do a wall sit. And then have someone walk across their legs back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's totally, totally fine. That's a good one. Well, you made me do that workout, and then I don't, I don't do the jujitsu stuff. And so he'd make me sit on a bike and do the bike. Mm-hmm. Made me do the bike one time, and like kept yelling at me the whole time. I was like, forget this. Yeah, that's when, we, that's when we had yeah. an Airdyne bike yeah. right off the mat. Yes. And so it's like, all right, well, if you don't feel like throwing yeah. up, there's an Airdyne bike. So <laughs> yeah. let's go no, ahead and throw no, up. He's like, like, he's like, you, when we do this, you're going to be on the bike. And that's, I'm like, ah. Oh. Well, so. so for you two, it was the same place, but this the last time I felt so unbelievably gassed out, because I encourage people all the time, at least once a week, you need to redline, yeah. where you're doing something, whether it's airdyne or sprints or you know some sort of a hit workout or something like that, where you literally feel like you redlined, you couldn't have done anymore. But the last time I felt like I literally could not have gone any faster was for one of the, so what we do at Fight Club is we typically are all reading the same book. And then, you know, we talk about the book you know, for 30 or 45 minutes, whatever the reading was for that week. I would lead a workout, um, which we call a warm up, which technically you do warm up. You just warm up and stay really, really warm. Some would call it hot, <laughs> but then we would do jujitsu after that. So for whatever reason, this Sunday, I was like, all right, we're just going to do a hundred burpees for time. And so yep, it's a nice. hundred burpees it's as good. fast as you can possibly go. Yep. And so I had done a hundred burpees as a workout several times. And, you know, I timed it like one time it was like, you know, 10 minutes, 11 minutes, something like that, doing hundred burpees, but it was kind of at a kind of a reasonable pace. But this night I was like, okay, I am going to empty the tank. I'm going to do a hundred burpees and do them all perfectly. No cheating burpees, you know, leave the ground every time I come up and I'm going to see if I can get a hundred burpees in under 50, five minutes. Wow. Right. So I kind of did the math, like how, how that would work out. I was like, okay, if you take one deep, extra deep breath, like, or take one little break, you're not going to make it. Right. And Jermaine, uh, you know, shout out to downtown Jermaine Brown. He was there. He's one of the best athletes I've ever been around. He always looks like he's having fun when he's dying, working yeah. out. It's just one of those things. He's just smiling and yeah, you can do it guys. And all this bull crap. And so I was like, okay, he was like 10 feet away from me. And I'm like, all right, I got to beat him. Like, so I, there's no way I'm getting beat by him. And so I did 100 burpees in four minutes and 59 seconds. Wow. Like I got in right under. And so I get up like I normally do. I get up and I'm like, all right, stone face. We're just going to get up and walk around. Like it doesn't matter how tired you are. You just go stone face. I get up, I take two steps and I go, whoof. And then I go right back <laughs> down and I just lay down on my back for probably two minutes just to really like catch my breath and bring my heart rate down because it was like, I was trying to be cool and trying to walk it off. There was no walking it off. And there like, was Jermaine standing over you and he was yeah, like, man, yeah, I did it I three say, minutes and 50 nope, seconds. Jermaine was <laughs> yeah. like five minutes, 20 something seconds. So suck it, Jermaine. All right. I beat you that one time. We don't have to talk about the last time we rolled jujitsu or anything like that. No one cares about how that worked out but in burpees in that one time in history i was able to knock it out if you weighed 150 pounds you'd do it faster too okay that's the other thing is he's like a feather and so it's like you know whenever you're showing a workout it's like well if i had a 22 inch waist (laughs) and weighed like a feather pillow what a feather pillow weighs then yeah i would probably be able to do that move a lot easier as well we got a little bit more trunk weight over on this side of the table but hey let's dig into psalm 42 all that will make sense here in a second in terms of like being completely gassed out so caleb if you can read all of psalm 42 and then we'll start digging in verse by verse. You bet. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all night long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in ter- turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By, the Lord, by day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? 
Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So um, this is a good psalm for whatever reason. If you're like a new King James or King James person, this is like a fun one to read. I probably should have made you do that, but the ESV is also fantastic. But we have a very experienced deer hunter in our midst. So Mr. Smith over here has put a lot of poor, innocent Bambies uh, to their final moments, right? And so a lot of arrows and a lot of bullets have taken out these poor, innocent animals. How dare you, you unbelievable beast. But when we read this Psalm, because I remember Joby, the first time he pointed this out, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been reading this like a dumber this entire time. Because it's like, I think of a deer just standing by a stream, you know, this beautiful 12 point buck, just, you know, standing by a stream. But this is saying the deer is panting, Yeah. right? So Adam, in your extensive experience chasing whitetail all over these United States, in what circumstances have you ever witnessed a deer pant? Usually when a buck is chasing a doe trying to breed her. Right. Happens a lot. Or whenever they... Are incredibly thirsty. That and predation, right? Oh, sure. So if you've seen, like, because I know we've seen in like different trail cams when you've got a cat that's trying to take down a deer or if you're hunting and people are kind of a little bit loud hunting or something like that and the deer is actually like running for their life and you see a deer that is like completely wasted, exhausted. Mm -hmm. But like, I've never really <laughs> thought about that until someone pointed out, they're like, hey, uh, deers don't just pant. I just said deers. deers. So yeah, sorry. You know, <laughs> the plural. <laughs> the plural for deers. It's them dang deers. Gooses. But it's like, yeah. Uh, but like, um, that's one of those things is like, when you read certain things, it's just you need someone else to point out like, no, like this is one of those moments where he's so exhausted that he might die. That's what he's describing. And I missed that point. Yeah. When I first read it. Because like, I'm reading it and I'm thinking of the deer panting. Like, I'm thinking the deer's getting to the water. Like, this is exactly like the note that I wrote down. I'm thinking of a majestic scene of this beautiful green forest where this little pond lies. And here comes a deer searching for a stream because it's so thirsty and thankfulness. And then you go into, my tears been my, have been my food. Where is your God? And like, out of nowhere, here comes Adam. and just blows this deer right before he could take a drink out of the water. Not you know, Adam of Adam and Eve fame, but Adam, Adam of killing deer <laughs> yeah, fame sitting right here. Yeah, right. I was like, I was like, man, that's like, this guy's like falling apart. Yeah, You know, like he's, he's thirsty, he's hungry, but like, I've been reading the explicit gospel again, mm. you know, and uh, uh, Matt Chandler brings up this verse, this exact verse. And he's like, a deer pants for water. Why don't we pant for God like that anymore? We do not search for God like we used to. And like, I found that so convicting when reading this verse. That's good. What kind of deer do you think it was? Was it a white tail or a mule deer? Oh. Well, I mean, Mr. Horn over here. He uh, killed his first deer last year during okay. last season out at Adam's hunting land. I did. So I've you're, never killed one. You're up, you're up this yeah. year, my friend. This is it. I'm yeah. ready. Yeah, yes. Let's go. So, yes. So I was, it? So I was told you only kill does this time when I was going over there. So I got doe tags and he found out I hadn't killed anything. And he's like, get a buck tag because you're shooting the first thing you see, which was a coyote. If it's brown, it's down. <laughs> <But> then it was <laughs> yeah, he killed a poor baby coyote, Dude, that gummit. Matt, Matt was like, I've never, look, I've never seen a guy look so defeated. <laughs> Then you dragging that coyote into the forest. <laughs> it was it was World War II, because didn't you kill a pig, a coyote, and a buck on the no, first day? I just killed a buck. It was a yearling too. So you what, killed the what buck Kyle and the would call a doe. So <laughs> that's what they say. Hey, no, I've I, shot a button buck before, so like I I've, I don't have any room to talk. I've so never, yeah, I, I've, I've never hunted in my life. Oh, dude, it's, it's my dad good. never we're, never did it. We're fixing that this year, yeah. my friend. I'm, okay, I'm but you, Adam, you have no aversion to hunting. No, though. not at all. You just haven't had the yeah. opportunity. I want to kill him with my bare hands. Oh, yeah. man. You, you, might, that? you might start with a rifle. You <laughs> might just see okay, how that okay. goes, and then we can right. put you in a tree well, with a spear. Yep. We Kyle, can, Kyle's going to make me clean my own deer next year. Yeah, see, that was so the one thing. So, because, you know, it's the baby steps, right? So you shoot this little yearling, doesn't matter. So that's one of the cool things, you know, you know, Adam, like, you're very, very uh, generous with your knowledge of yeah. hunting because you've hunted your entire life. I started hunting in my mid-20s. Ryan started hunting last year. Caleb started hunting this year. Today. And so, like, you are <laughs> you give knowledge, but also there are people that get really, really stingy and they have so many rules so that when someone comes and hunts for the first time, you're so nervous the entire time because you're like, oh gosh, is this rule 17 or 18 or did this guy even say I shouldn't do this? But for you, you have a rule that, hey, if this is your first time hunting and it comes out, you shoot it. If it's yeah. brown, it's down. Mm -hmm. nice. And like, it takes all of the, because I feel that angst now since I've killed a decent sized, uh, you know, buck to where it's like, okay, you can't just shoot anything that, that comes mm -hmm. out of the woods. It's like, okay, that's maybe that's not a shooter. Hey, let's let that one go. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, 
But whenever it's your first time, you're just, you're thinking, okay, how do I do this without shooting myself literally in the foot or just making some sort of mistake or wounding an animal and not taking it down? So that's a cool thing that you do in terms of your approach. It's very, very inviting for people that come and hunt with you. All these trophy hunters, they want to grow the biggest deer they possibly can and they right. they lose the aspect that it's supposed to be a fun and enjoyable and exciting thing. And when somebody hasn't done it before, you need to in foster that and yeah. you need to make sure that they have an enjoyable time, they have fun, and that means whatever comes out, if they want to shoot that, shoot it. It's great. And that's a great thing that I love about you, Adam, is you're so patient with people. Mm. You're so patient. Like even Matt, like you guys are so patient with me and I'm I'm an idiot. So it was it was awesome. But it but I had a great time. Didn't it make you feel less pressure because you're already under pressure oh, yeah. because you're doing something that you've never done. And here, here's the other thing. You're very successful in your career. You, you've got a good family. You've got a lot of people that, that love you and respect you, but you are a white belt at hunting, right? I am a white like, belt at hunting. You're a black belt and all these other different things. And same thing for you, Caleb. Very successful, four beautiful children, lovely wife and family. And like a lot of people like look to you for leadership and different things, but you're a white belt at hunting. What's and before so, a white belt? Uh, nothing like <laughs> dead people. That's what's yeah. before, like l- complete losers. Yeah. That's what, but it's like you're, you've gotten in the game. And so, yeah. but your next step is not only getting another deer, but it's cleaning it yourself yeah. and like, you know, dealing with the guts and figuring out the different cuts of meat and yeah. things like that. Maybe even butchering the entire thing because you didn't really do that last no, year. It wasn't it. really something you were comfortable with, but it's like, okay, well, now you've, you've, you're, you're going to have a year of like getting more used to that process. Yeah. And so I'm curious for you, Caleb. So I know why, why I had never hunted until I was an adult, but for you, like, what has been the, the reason, like as an Okie, having lived here basically your entire, well, here in Kansas and different things like that, right. like how have you not gone hunting before? I think it was just because my dad was never into it. Yeah. You same. know, I mean, it, and same. actually, ironically, like I've I've been on hunts. In Kansas, they hunted, I mean, it was a ton of like pheasant, quail. Mm-hmm. So I had buddies that had dogs and we went. I mean, I was, I was there, but I just never, never went to like the kid, like, you know, what hunter safety course or all that stuff. Like, and I've got four boys. So I'm like, I'd really want them to have the option at least, you know? And like, I have tons of friends that do it. I mean, family that does it. I mean, I even have Northwest Oklahoma. I don't know what you hunt up there, but tons of land up there, like all of it. So he just never, he never did it. So he never well, passed it on. I gave everyone. All right. So I keep having these things for everyone that comes on the forging table. So like I told everyone by December 31st of 2024, everyone at the forging table should be able to do 10 pull-ups, right? So we have some people that are on on there, but maybe the thing for 2025 is everyone has to have killed an animal legally, right? Not, yeah. you know, not, not just killing a dog that yeah, I would. There's I, a neighbor's <laughs> dog. That's really annoying. So it's like, does that right. count? Okay. So maybe we'll do that, but it's awesome that you've admitted that, but like, dude, now that you've admitted it, you got I'm a ready. bunch of people that are going to hold your feet to the fire. We're going to get after it. We're going to get I you need something. An invite. You, you got just got it. You got it. Yeah, let's do it. You got the, the invite. We'll get you out there. All I, right. try, I try to bring at least one person every year that has never been hunting before to my place to harvest a deer. And it's Sweet. either, you know, an older person or it might be a kid. Either way, but you're it. You I'm got in. it. Yes. Man. I got last year, so you got this year. Well, yeah, you're nice. you're like an old wily veteran now. Like, you're yeah. Elmer <laughs> Fudd, essentially, at this point. So <laughs> Look like they, it. Well, you know, so. I, you said it. I didn't. But, <laughs> hey, guys, before we uh, continue, because there's a lot of great stuff here with Psalm 42, just wanted to remind you that we've got a couple of resources for you. Check it out in the show notes. But if you want to start your own forging table, Crossway is partnered with us to do a forging table starter set. There are five amazing books that will help you get started with your own forging table. That is in the show notes. You can get all of those books for 50% off. And the Logos Bible Soft, which is one of the most incredible computer programs period that I've ever dealt with in my entire life. But they have the best Bible study program on planet Earth. Ryan's used it before. You know, we've had a lot of pastors that are kind of in our orbit that use a Logos Bible software. But you can get the software at a discount if you use the link that is in our show notes. Go there and check that out. But I want to dig into verses two and three. And Ryan, you talked about it just a little bit, but verses two and three, my soul thirsts for God for the living God, right? So not some, you know, dead God, not the Mm -hmm. God described in any other book, but for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where's your God? Okay. My tears have been my food day and night. What a brutal, sad, just completely full of anguish line that is. And so I want to talk about it even just a little bit deeper Because we talked about last week, you know, the valley of the shadow of death. And we all brought up a story about our children. And as Joby says, you know, there's no pain like kid pain and, you know, all those different things. But there was a situation that I was going through in my life where, 
Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. There is a uh, a kind of a folk uh, country singer guy named Dylan Gossett. He has a song called Flip a Coin. And so, um, you know, I'm just getting ready or something like that. And I'm literally, I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, right? And I'm just like, you're trying to make it to the next hour, right? I'm just trying to find the energy and the whatever to make it to the next hour. And I'm just, you know, I just have music going while I'm getting ready for the day or whatever. And there's a line in his song, Flip a Coin, called, Sometimes We're Living Just to Die. And I can't really explain it, but in that moment, I just start blubbering. So there's different categories of crying. There's crying, right? So, you know, dog dies in a movie and, you know, just a single tear, right? Rolls down your cheek, right? So there's crying. There's like sobbing, right? You know, maybe your dog died, Here, another dog died story, but maybe, you know, someone really close to you dies really and you're just dogs. uncontrollably sobbing and you're just heaving and, and that type of thing. But like blubbering is where you're just like, <laughs> and it was in that moment. I, it's funny now looking back at it, but in that moment, I was so sad and I was sad to the point of death. I'd even told one of my foxhole buddies, I'm like, I just, I don't just want to die. Like, I'm so sad. I just want to die. I don't want to feel the way I feel anymore. And then a song I had heard before, a line that I had heard before, literally hit me square between the eyes. And then whenever, you know, not long thereafter, I read Psalm 42 and I read, my tears have been my food day and night. Man, you don't understand how beautiful God is and how we win in the end unless you've gone through that valley of the shadow of death. And so, man, it's just right here again in Psalm 42. I think J Mac basically says like David right now is in severe divine drought. So it's like on last week's episode, you talked about, Hey man, I delayed sanctification. Mm -hmm. So like he's in a divine drought right now. Like maybe he's going through life and he's not, he's like, God, where are you? Why aren't you here? I'm drowning is basically what he's saying. And I'm thirsty for you, but I don't feel you here. And it's like, where are we, what are we doing in our life? that we're not putting him first and we're not, we're not panting for him. Like we, a deer would pant for water. Mm -hmm. And why are we sitting in the divine drought that we are sitting in? So I, I, it really makes you think is like, is this God moving away from him? Cause that's what he's kind of pointing to, mm -hmm. or was he moving away from God and is now coming back to the altar? Right. What about you guys? What do you think? I mean, just the when shall I come and appear before God is what stands out to me, right? It's just the, I mean, we've, we've said it, you've said it, but just the, the longing for, for really for death, for the afterlife, right? For heaven, for what he has in store for us. So, I mean, it's, I've never felt that way. Um, but you know, I can see, I mean, having been around it, you know, with grandparents and things like that, and you can see where you get to that point, but that's obviously not the point he's at in his life. Um, so it just, I mean, it stands out. I think the hard part about this is it just gets progressively worse. The deer is panting. My soul thirsts for God. When can I go meet God? Please, I need to go meet him. My tears have been my food. Where is God? People around me are saying, where is your God? You know, it's like putting the knife in and now they're going to twist it. Job. You know, exactly. Right. Yeah. The thing I have a question for is you're sitting in that, you know, you're blubbering, you're crying. And the one thing that po uh, that's pointed out to me is I pour out my soul. To God, do you pour out your? Did you pour out your soul? Well, let, so let's actually dig in. Let's go to okay. verse four, which is where you're bringing that up. So these things Sorry, I remember. I have it through one no, and four. no, this is great. So these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Okay, so having a worshipful heart while in the depths of despair. I am horrible about this. Admittedly terrible about this. And so the example that I use, so like the easy thing is when people hear, you know, praise or songs of praise, they obviously think of worship music. Okay. So I know people that when they're angry or when they're so frustrated or when they're in their own personal valley of the shadow of death, what brings them comfort is positive, encouraging K love, right? <laughs> they just turn that on and it is just, gosh, it is Kari Job and then it's Phil Wickham and then it's Hillsong and then it's Bethel and then it's just boom, 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 hitting them in the fields. It's 74 choruses followed by a bridge and another chorus and then they get the commercials that are also positive. And God, that's all that happens. I listen to the most angry, rough, brutal music possible when I'm angry. Because when I'm angry, I'm like, 
all right, mother effers, I'm going to be really angry. Like, that's just kind of where I go. Like, that's where all of that ginger energy goes. It's like, oh, you think I'm mad? Let's show you some mad. Let's listen to a song about a bat being thrown at a baby or something. Like, it's just (laughs) the most angry thing that you can possibly think of. And do you know how much that helps me? Zero. None. (laughs) Not at all. You know what it makes me? More angry. Farther away from God in those moments. Because, again, admittedly, some of these bands, some of them have, you know, satanic, uh, you know, lyrics or, or things that are tied to witchcraft or to murder or to all kinds of things. But in that moment, it's the angriest stuff that I know of in existence. So that's what I'm going to put in. And so that's one of my big things is, you know, gosh, he, this deer is panting for the water. His soul is thirsty. His, you know, his tears have fed him and sustained him throughout the night. But then with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival, like that's where he's leading towards. I'm just so bad with it. Like, I don't know how it is for you guys, but like, I'm a, it's bad. Uh, let's make it 20% worse and just to show everybody that I can endure this as well. Not healthy, but yeah. admittedly, that's what I do. Same. I mean, I just want to break things, you know? I yeah. And it's like, I'm, I'm pretty cool, calm, and then I'm not. And then it's like, don't get in front of me. I've never seen the other side, Caleb. Not like, very I'm many people curious. have. Okay. Not very many people have, but uh, unfortunately, it's only the ones closest to me, right? Yeah. There's, how holes, typically there's goes. been holes in the wall, but, um, I mean the, the, as I pour out my soul, like that's the part I've always struggled with. Meaning like when I, the house I grew up in, it was like, don't have your feelings out playing with them. That's how people get hurt, mm. you know? <laughs> so it was really just stuff it down. And it's been a, I mean, it's like a 20 year thing just trying to, I mean, I don't, for the sake of sounding soft, like to get in touch with that. Mm. Right. I'm but it's, about uh, it. It, it's just been a struggle. It always has. I feel so. I feel the same. And what, <clears throat> Kyle, what you were saying, I feel like, were you saying with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng, that's the part that you're not good at? I'm horrible at it. Okay, I agree. You are terrible. About Shut it. your yeah. mouth. <laughs> I, you just but, totally set me up. What I was, Golly, this is my table. But what I was gonna, what I was gonna no, say this is, is a forging God, table. <laughs> as I pour out my soul, <laughs> as I pour out my soul, you are very good at that, especially yeah. with the guys around this table. And you are v- vulnerable, and you've always been open with the things that you're fighting with and the things that you're wrestling with, way more vulnerable than I can be. So mm. you and I both struggle in that yeah. side. You're strong in that side. That's well, where like when stuff like like that sort of thing happens to me, you just won't be able to find me. Right. I like agree. I'll be yeah. gone. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, so yeah. I didn't used to be that way. <clears throat> Honestly, Adam, um, you know, Matt uh, Grassmeyer brought up something uh, a few months ago on the forging table where he, you know, our group was trying to break the the attendance record for a women's soccer game, collegiate soccer game, and we, we all the all the you know pins were set up. We were going to knock it down. We were going to obliterate this record, and then we had like tornado warning, torrential downpour, lightning, games canceled, and I couldn't be found. I went to some random corner of the stadium and I just sat. I didn't like sit there and cry. I was just so mad that I couldn't fathom being around somebody and not just like being completely consumed with anger. And so I would just hide. And the way that I, you know, I don't know how it is for you, Caleb, but the way that I kind of qualified it in my brain is if I'm around somebody right now, I'm going to say and do things that I regret. So I'm just going to go hide. I'm going to Scots Irish this anger and I'm just going to shove it down deep into my belly and not deal with it. And so where I kind of came to, and I don't know that it was a conscious decision, Adam, to where it's like, okay, I'm telling people they need a foxhole. I'm telling people that they need to trust the guys around them. I'm telling them that they need to get up under the weight and shoulder some of the burden that's on the bar for some of these other guys. Well, if you're going to be a guy like that, or if you're going to accept that from other people, you need to be a guy like that for other people as well. And I can't have y'all shoulder my burden if you don't know what it is. It's kind of like these people and, you know, not anyone in particular, like someone maybe in our Sunday school where every week the prayer request is unspoken. Yeah. It's like, okay, <laughs> help me understand what exactly you're going through. This unspoken prayer nonsense, like that doesn't help anybody because perhaps God is setting me up to help answer the prayer, the thing that you're struggling with to provide a pathway for you out of some sort of plight that has befallen you or that you've brought upon yourself. And so for me, I guess I've just like, to for, for better or for worse, I'm going to let you know exactly what's on my mind and exactly what I'm going through. And I'm not going to spare any detail. And I don't share for dramatic sake. I share to be like, this is exactly what I'm up against. This is exactly how I'm struggling. Please help. You mentioned that in our Sunday school at one point when you got up and you spoke and you, you talked about the importance of 
we're not just here as a small group of people to get together and have fun with each other. We need to bear each other's burdens. And in order to do that, it's going to get messy. And we need to bring up that mess. And we need to be able to comfortable and feel safe in this setting that maybe there's something that you've gone through before that helps me learn mm-hmm. that I had no idea that you'd done that before. And, and I think it's good that we pour out our souls to each other. But I think what this passage is getting at is, do we pour out our souls to God? Right. Like you're in that position. You're great at pouring out your soul to us. But how are you in pouring out your soul to God? Like when you were in that whole mindset of like, it's not worth living. Like, I don't want to feel this pain anymore. Like, were you pouring that out to God and were you seeking him in that? And that's that's what I, that's, I think that's what, he, what we're trying to get at here is like, it's, I can tell you the times that like I've been blubber a blubbery mess. Like my marriage was on the rocks. Um, I was a horrible person who co- talked about himself in the third person. Was a total d bag, you know. And there was a time that I just broke down in the shower and said, "God, who am I?" I felt like, like you ever seen the other guys where Will Ferrell, you know, like Will Ferrell's like I guess like a a pimp at a college, like inadvertently becomes one <laughs> named Gator. And like, there's a time where he just like, you know, like you see this like clean cut guy and then throughout college he starts doing this stuff. And in the end, you know, he's talking about how he met his wife in the hospital and he's got like this gun and these gold teeth and he's like, uh, like life is just horrible. And he's that was like, you is what you're saying? You well, had the yeah, gun I and was, the gold teeth? No, I didn't have a gun and a gold okay. teeth, but I was just like, I was broken down. I was a broken down human being. And I, I was trying to find, um, I was just trying to find comfort in other things. It could be alcohol, women, or what, but I was not finding that comfort in God. I was not pouring myself out to God. I was pouring myself out to other people. And that's a good thing. I think that we should pour ourselves out to our brothers, especially when we're trying to go through, through things, but we should learn to pour ourselves out to God. So uh, I'm glad you actually brought that up because, well, one quick thing, let me go back to the comment that Adam made. So whenever I was speaking in front of our Sunday school, which Caleb, you're the only one here at this table that doesn't come to our Sunday school. What's the deal? Why, why don't you like us? Come on. But uh, part of the thing is, is we go, we all go to the same church. It's in the affluent part of town, in the most affluent city in this in the state, and everyone is perfect, right? All the men are successful in business and all their shirts have no wrinkles in them. All the women have, you know, they're perfectly put together, right? Some of them, like, anyway, we'll skip on, but the kids are always behaving. Like, everyone looks amazing. Like, our church is gorgeous, right? Like, it is just a minefield for anybody that's got problems with, you know, voyeurism, male or female, right? But the level of depravity in our city is so astonishingly high because you know what comes along with that? What comes along with the perfectly manicured lawns and you know the detailed escalades and all those different things are when the 14-year-old daughter gets pregnant, the family has the means to make sure that that problem goes away and the, the girl misses a week of school because she's sick and then no one has to learn about what their daughter did. Um, a lawsuit comes and they've got the lawyers and the people on retainer to make sure that that doesn't get into into the news cycle so that they don't look bad like you know the the drinking the the you know use use of illicit drugs the swinging like the all these kinds of things these things happen all over the place in our community and at our church well I don't know about the swingers I haven't seen any pineapple shirts walking around except for one <laughs> that one time but like we, we we have those things and I had just gotten so fed up with it and here I was in my own personal valley of the shadow of death. And I'm in this, this room with all these beautiful people. And some of them had helped shoulder the burden and some hadn't. And I was just like, you know what? If this is a social club, go join Kiwanis or go join like some, you know, something where you can just pretend, where you can just show up, eat your, you know, lukewarm cheese and meat from the charcuterie table and then just move on with your life an hour and a half later. But it's like, if we're going to be an ecclesia, if we're going to be a community of believers that are there for each other, we have to freaking be there for each other. Mm -hmm. And I can't help you shoulder your burden if you pretend like you got it going on and nothing's going wrong. Mm -hmm. I can't help you do that. And so with what you were saying, Ryan, with the pouring out your soul to God. Another thing that I'm not great at because it's a lot easier to just call one of you knuckleheads and you say, hey, come on over. I've got a cigar and a whiskey. Can you listen to me lament for a little bit? Because I don't know if it's like, I feel like, hey, God's busy. He's got He's got stuff going on. Like there are people literally starving to death right now. And like my life's just kind of mildly falling apart. Like this isn't really his concern. But I will say there was a time in my life where I went to, uh, I went to a church that's kind of like a come to the altar type church. Right. So some, some churches are very much like, don't get out of your freaking seats, weirdos. Like, and certainly don't raise your hands during worship. But like, this was like, hey, when, when the sermon's done, 
we're just going to open up the altar, right? So if, if, if you've, you know, met Christ for the first time or chose Christ or Christ chose you and you just now realize it, whatever your theological persuasion, come on down, talk to us about that. But also if you've got a burden, if you're heavy, and I mean, at this church, like there's literally like knee pads, like that line, the front of the the church, right? So like you can get in there and get after it. And so I go, and I don't think I've talked about this on the show before, but I'm sitting front row at this church. And from the moment I walked into the service, I was looking at the altar because I was going through it, man. I was, yeah. I was going through the valley of the shadow of death and I'm just looking at that altar and I'm just like, and, and I'll just be open. It, it was church 1122. Okay. So, you know, it was Joby's church, San Pablo campus. Uh, there I am in Jacksonville. Okay. So for anybody wondering, there you go. And so during the worship set, I'm just staring at the altar. I'm like, should I go down there? Like, that's kind of weird. It's kind of public. People kind of know you're, you don't really have it going on. And then the entire time during the sermon, Joby wasn't preaching this particular night. And you know, the whole time he's talking, I'm like, man, when he's done, I know he's going to invite people to the altar. Well, like, what am I going to do? And so for whatever reason, whenever he invited people to come to the altar, I'm like, okay, 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 okay. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And it's one of those moments where in my head, that was only like a five second internal dialogue, but it was probably a little bit longer because by the time my body started moving toward the altar, a bunch of people were already there. Right. So I was in the front row. People came down from like the rafters. Right. And so they're already, they had beat me to the altar. And so I go to uh, like the squeeze in right next to this guy. And it's like, you've got the stage and then it's this guy. And I completely misjudge how big that guy is, how big I am and how big the space is between us and the stage. And so I end up having to like squeeze amoeba my body into this space between this very large uh, human man and you know the stage. And I get there and I'm uncomfortable because I'm up there. I'm uncomfortable because I'm squished and I'm already distracted. I feel like Satan's all over me. Like, God, you weirdo. What are you doing going to the altar? Like, do you know how many people know you here? Like how many people listen to your show and now they see you down here, like a weakling on your knees. And somehow I, I push all that out and I just start just start trying to pray and start being like, God, what are you trying to show me right now? Like what, what is happening right now? How is this, how is all of this happening right now? And then at some point I feel a couple of hands on my shoulders and they felt like some beefy man hands. And so I'm like, all right, well, somebody's here in this fight with me, all right? And then it was kind of in that moment, I just kind of broke down and I really did pour out my soul to God and just said, okay, no more no more cockiness, no more ego, no more me, no more undaunted life, no more pushback darkness, none of that stuff. And I just kind of let her rip. And then um, I've come to find out the hands that were on me were Joby's. And he was praying over me in that moment and he started to pray out loud. And then I lost it even more because it's like, he's got crap to do. He's got things on his calendar and here he is with his hands on me because he knows I'm going through it right now. And it was in that moment that I poured my, my heart and soul out to God. But think about the road to get there. Like I had to get on a plane. I had to go to a church service. I had to give myself a pep talk for an hour. And, you know, like, am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? And then finally I had to like move my body to go and do it. And it's like, gosh, I should not have had that much of a of a runway to get to that outcome. Yeah. Like, I'm glad that it happened. It was a positive thing overall for for the, the season that I was in. But man, uh, all I could think now in this moment is like, I'm glad that I did that. But gosh, why wasn't that? Why isn't this more common? Why didn't I get there faster? It's a great like example of the Christian walk and how we walk as Christians. Like we huh. have to let those things go and we have to give it to God. And it's so hard to do. It's so hard when we want to control everything and we want to not seem that we seem like we don't have it all together, but we don't, you know, like you guys, you guys will get on me about the tulips, like, you know, Grassmeyer sent us texts, like tulip fields and stuff like that. But the biggest thing that brought me to my knees is total depravity mm -hmm. and just realizing that I am a depraved human being. I'm a sinner, no different than other sinners. And that I, they need a savior and I need a savior just as much, even though I may feel like I'm not, I need them. I need him just as much. And you needed him just as much. And it's like, you finally surrendered it all and went up to that altar and you poured your heart out to him. And that's what he wanted, you know? And like, you know, whatever situation you're going through, maybe that's why God put you through it. I don't know, you know, but what I do know is that what came out of that is you poured your heart out to him and, and he was there. So, and it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful, man. It almost brought a tear to my eyes. I'm not, I'm not, go what, what was it? A blubbering? But I mean, like. <laughs> Please no blubbering at the table, right? It takes yeah, too long to no, clean up. I, yeah, I'm not going to blubber, but no, man, it was just, it's a beautiful thing to hear, man. And it's, mm -hmm. and I've been there. Mm -hmm. I've been there twice, you yeah. know? It's like, and every time I've, I've been there, I've had to come to the conclusion that I am so full of myself 
And you're talking to a guy who gave himself his own nickname. You know, twice. Twice. Yeah. <laughs> the other one was a joke. In- but, including last week. Yeah. Nope. We all remembered it happening. Dude, it was legitimate. I was there. Well, it was, was because there it was because Joby said, Well, John gave himself his own nickname. That's true. So but I am nowhere so near if John. John. Does it, if John so, does it, I guess you yeah, can do it. No, I'm nowhere near John. But no, but like I was it was the arrogance that I had and the arrogance that I carried. And sometimes it's you know, God takes that arrogance and it's and it's a great thing when he does. That's I'm glad so that you said you've been there twice because I feel the same way. And it's like you get you get to that moment. And then eventually it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen again. Same thing with you, Kyle. At some point, you know, you've accomplished that. You've climbed that mountain. There's going to be more mountains. And that's why we need to have the group that we've Mm -hmm. got to continue to forge through that. I mean, it's it's a good place for us to go. You know, it doesn't always have to be when we're in the valley. That's true. Right? Um, I mean, it was, uh, it was, I was listening to a Tim Keller deal on, on this, on chapter 42. And he said, he actually titled this talking to yourself, not listening to yourself. Meaning like kind of what you were dealing with Kyle, which is like, if we listen to ourselves, like just like in verse five here, like it's usually a lot of pretty negative self-talk, right? Whereas like if we're, if we're talking to ourselves, we can remind ourselves and speak truth to ourselves. That's like, no, pouring out my soul is a good thing, right? Uh, singing shouts of praise is a good thing. Like, this is who you are. This is what we need to do. Um, And just watching, like, or uh, seeing what uh, verse five is talking about here with the turmoil he's in. I mean, even when we go to the Lord in prayer and it's just like, I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, I'm not, I'm not feeling like I'm close to you in any way. I mean, all that stuff is good just to pour the soul out. Uh, So. Well, and I don't know about you guys, but my internal dialogue is, like dog water. It is, it is yeah. terrible. And so like, no one has said something meaner to me than I have said to me. Like it is just terrible. But when you're pouring yourself out, out to God, you're pouring those feelings into the ultimate filter of like, did I make somebody that like that, like the man that you just described that you are, did, did I, that, did I do that? Did I, did I make you to be that man? Oh, I didn't. And yeah. so like, you know, when God speaks to me, he speaks to me kind of like a sarcastic coach where he's just kind of like, oh, was that the play that I called? Are you sure that was the play that I called? Because when you got the ball, you did something that didn't seem to make sense and it didn't quite work out, did it? Look, so it's kind of like how God talks to Job in the book of Job. Were you there? Gird up Were your you loins. there when I did all of this? Yeah. Like, slow your roll, champ. Like, you know, one of those things. Well, the other thing we have, to, we have to think about is like, I think John Owen said it best. He's like, let our hearts admit I am poor and weak and Satan is too subtle, too cunning, too powerful. He watches constantly for advantages over my soul. The world presses it presses in upon me with all sorts of pressure, pleas, and pretense, pretenses. My own corruption is violent, tumultuous, enticing, and entangling, and it conceives sin. It wars within me and against me. Occasions and opportunities for temptations are immeasurable. No wonder I do not know how deeply involved I have been with sin. Therefore, on God alone, I will rely for my keeping I will continually look to him. Like that was something that like I heard that the second time I was going through my my season. And it's just like, man, I I have to admit my sin. I have to admit where I'm at and I have to go and put my eyes on him. Because like Satan's always looking for a way. Well, like you guys were just pointing out, you know. Well, just what Adam was saying. It's like you either just went through it, you're going through it, or you're about to go through it. Yeah. Like those are the only options. And some of you have lived charmed lives, I'm sure. Some of you listening to this right now is like, I just don't understand these guys. These guys must be just some of the dumbest, like most unlucky people ever. Maybe that's you and you should feel blessed because I think for all of us, we want our kids to not have a testimony to a degree, right? Like if we've had to go through hardship and all that, don't we not want that for our kids? But it's the hardship that causes us to rely on God, that causes us to get through it, to show some resilience and be on the other side. Um, We got to speed up a little bit. I kind of got us off uh, here in the first four verses. Let's do the next three, so five through seven. So why are you cast down on my soul and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to death deep at the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. And so 
First of all, I don't know why, but just the the line "Deep calls to deep" is such a cool yeah. line. Mm-hmm. I don't know why it's so cool because I deep. like do uh, yeah, not <laughs> pun intended. But no, I, I read so many different commentaries on verse seven, and none of them had anything to say about "Deep calls to deep." So I, apparently, it's just a super dope line whenever it is like translated into English. But you can see here that David sees God kind of as the source of his plight, like all of your breakers. He's talking to God, and all of your waves have gone over me. So again, this goes to what we were talking about last week in Psalm 23 is it's like, look, God's going to allow you to get, go through some stuff, but he's going to allow you to go through some stuff so that you will reach out to him, rely on him and have him sustain you through the stuff. And so Adam, with what you were talking about, like, you know, again, we're either have just gone through it, we're going through it or we're about to go through it. Well, when it's someone else's turn Mm -hmm. and you've gone through something similar or where you had similar thoughts and actions, aren't you then more qualified to help them in that moment? Absolutely. Right? And so it's the same thing with parenting. It's like a kid, you know, they get broken up with by their first girl that they loved and they're 17 and their world is definitely over and they're never going to find love and they're sure of it. And yet you've gone through that and you said, I love you to a girl. And then eventually she gave you your letter jacket back or something like that. And then, you know, Mm -hmm. that wasn't your girl anymore. But you made you made your way through it. But you have you have the hindsight of having been through it, so you can help in that moment. Exactly right. I feel like verses five through seven. I start getting on a roller coaster with this psalm, and it's like yeah, it's like schizophrenic. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's all over the place. It's highs and lows. Praising God, this is great, and then all of a sudden, now my soul is downcast within me. It's like, what are we talking about here? It's yeah. constantly up and down. I like the contrast of drought and he's thirsting, and now he's just getting hit with water. Oh, yeah. I never like, thought of that. Yeah, like, he's like, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm thirsty. I'm, I need you, Lord. And now now I'm just getting crushed by waves. And That's it, enough water, God. Yeah, like, chill out. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah, so. And, and think about this. This is from, from mountains. He's in the mountains now, and mm-hmm. he's getting crushed by a gigantic waterfall. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that we uh, that we didn't really, yeah, we didn't really get with into. Is, and Mizar. Yeah, yeah he, he wants all of those things, and then he, God's like, all right, like here it is. Yeah. Well, I've heard people before kind of, you can kind of categorize it as like kind of a cocky prayer. It's like, give me more God, like give, yeah. give me more, give me right up to the point that I can't handle it anymore. It's like, okay. All right. Like you are legitimately playing with the inventor of fire, not just fire at that yeah. point. And so it's like, again, most of us wouldn't choose the plight that you go through. But when you talk to anybody that's been through something horrific, whether it's a, a bad recovery or a sickness, or they've been betrayed in an extreme way, and when they do get on the other side of it, gosh, the level of maturity in that person and reliance on God and like, you know, cause your options are to get through it and let God help you or just to become a bitter, like navel gazing narcissist. And so it's like really only one of those ways is going to help you out in the end. Anything else on those before we move on to eight and nine? Let's go ahead and move on. All right, let's do it. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So why have you forgotten me? Maybe why have you forsaken me? I mean, our Savior Jesus felt this same type of feeling. But one thing that I wrote down, uh, this might be a swing and a miss, but when he says in verse eight, you know, at night, his song is with me. So I don't know if you guys have heard this. I don't know if this is more of like a charismatic thing or any of those types of deals. But uh, at night is a common time of attack for a lot of people. So if you have an addiction or you know, you're know you dealing with some rough thoughts, like nighttime seems to be a time when all the attacks become elevated. I've heard people talk about things like the witching hour. Um, there was a time period in my life where, so I, you know, I have the bladder of a seven-year-old drunk girl. And so I wake up like two or three times a night to go to the bathroom. But- I was waking up at like the same time in the middle of the night every night for months. And I mentioned that to someone. They're like, dude, that's the witching hour. And I'm like, what's that? That sounds terrible. (laughs) And he's like, that's the time when, you know, demonic activity is at its most peak. And I'm like, is that what's making me have to pee? Because I'd love to stay asleep. Can we figure out what medication can get me through the witching hour? But like, I, I, I talk about it somewhat tongue in cheek, but I have heard that, that there are times and there is demonic activity that kind of goes in these different waves. And there are times of increased demonic activity and that we shouldn't, you know, play around with that. So I don't know if y'all have like experienced that or heard that at all, or if this, I already said, this could be just a complete swing and a miss here. No witching hour. I've not heard that. No witching I've heard hour. the witching hour is like, hey. I mean, it's like right before, you know, dinner time. Yeah. It's like four to that's five That's like o'clock. the best. That's where we're at it's right like, now. Like we're like 10 minutes away from brisket downstairs. I've never downstairs. heard of that. But. 
I, All right. Well, I've great job, Kyle. That was <laughs> tremendous. Uh, man, you're so good at this. Ryan, don't even try to save me. I'm drowning. I'm deep calls to deep right now, and it's calling <laughs> me to drag me to the bottom of the ocean. Good grief. Let's spiritual move on. Spiritual warfare is going yeah, on yeah. at 4, 10 a.m. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be spiritual warfare. This is just what happens when your brain doesn't fire on all After cylinders. After I eat your chili, I hit the witching hour at like 4, 10 a.m. Oh. So. <laughs> hey, everyone at this table has experienced my chili, but let's let's give a shout out to my chili. It doesn't matter what happens intestinally after because the entire process is a lot of fun, no? Yeah, it's, I'm it is I'm with it. the best chili I've probably ever eaten. Yeah. Probably? probably. Do we need to like have a competition? Orcs? Chili? Uh, yeah, well, hey, did, did I make orcs chili? Or no, did you, I make backstrap you did, you did chili? Backstrap. Did okay, backstrap. I think I did some whitetail backstrap yeah. chili. Oh, it was good. Yeah. I, it hurt after, but it was good. But it's meant to hurt after because I want you to feel it. I want you to burp it up and sense it <laughs> days later. Oh, man. But guys, let's wrap up Psalm 42 here, verses 10 and 11. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the or all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So Adam, this goes back to what you were saying with like some of the previous chunks of verses, like five through seven, I literally wrote the word and spelled it poorly, schizophrenic. Like I have, yeah. I have no idea how to spell yeah. it, but I do know in general what that means. Yeah. But when you have schizophrenia, you will literally vacillate between these incredibly different emotions. And in 11 verses, the level of schizophrenic double-mindedness that we see is just all over it. And I like how he says, why are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? It's like he knows that he, he knows that he's schizophrenic in this. And then at the end, it's put your hope in God. Yeah, yeah. He said, I mean, he says that that basically that same thing, what, three or four times through the chapter. Um, and I think it was the... Uh, um, Tim Keller again that was talking about how he's trying to kind of reorder his hopes um, through the whole thing, and he kind of lands on the the right thing, obviously at the end. Yeah. Um, what were you gonna say? I'm just saying, like verse verse 11 is basically verse five all over again. It's right. like it's like the chorus of the song. So this is like a Hillsong song, or it's just the chorus uh, no, over and over no, and over. Is that what you're saying? It's not a Hillsong song because I hate this psalm all of a sudden. Because <laughs> it's not it's not about you. Oh, so it's not about boyfriend Jesus either. No, if it was if it was a Hillsong song, it'd be about you. Fantastic. But, uh, <laughs> but, I, go ahead. I've got sorry, one thing I want to read real quick. So this is when when I was kind of just doing a little research on reordering reordering hopes. Uh, so here's something real quick. So when I think about my justification, I won't dwell on shames and guilt. When I think about my sanctification, I realize God can change me. When I think about my adoption, I remember God does hear me and he loves me like a child. When I think about my fu future resurrection, I'm not afraid of dying. I just thought that was really cool. That's beautiful. All those. I can't think of a better way to close it out. What was yeah. that from? Was that just your own personal? No, it was from, uh, I, it was either Tim Keller or uh, Dr. TK. David Martin, no relation. I was going to say, David Martin Lloyd your dad? Jones. David Martin okay. Lloyd Jones. <laughs> that's yeah, like one way to give your dad a shout like out. like an Indiana Jones no. character. <laughs> what was no. the guy's name? David Dr. Lloyd. David Martin Lloyd Jones. David Martin Lloyd Jones. Uncle you know when Indiana you have Jones. more than three names, like yeah, you're him. like incredibly smart. <laughs> if you have to hyphenate at any point. Any other thoughts on Psalm 42 before we go eat brisket? Bam, bam, bam. All right, fantastic. Well, guys. We're going to leave it there, but come back next Sunday where we are going to dig into Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Make sure you read that and spend some time digging into that. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Again, don't forget about the Crossway Forging Table Starter Set. All of that information is here in the show notes. Also, the Logos Bible software. If you want to use that software at a discount, check out the link that is in our show notes. And also, guys, we are a donation-based ministry. If you want to see more things like the Forging Table coming out to you guys so that you can be equipped to push back darkness, hop on board and be a donor. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Perpetua, which is off their self-titled day Debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.